A farmer mistakenly drank his own herbicide. This is what happened to his organs. GW is a 41-year-old man presenting to the emergency room sweaty and panicked. He tells the admitting nurse that he took a swig out of what he thought was a new sports drink bottle, but the liquid inside wasn't a sports drink. Very quickly, a chemical test is done on his urine and it confirms to the medical team what had happened. They ask him for advanced directives because they need to sedate him and take control of his body to try and mitigate everything that's about to happen. And they need word from him on what to do in case this is the last time he's ever conscious. GW was a farmer in Middle America. Earlier that summer, he had been doing landscaping on his lot. To save some space in his barn, he thought to consolidate some of his leftover chemicals into smaller bottles. On hand, he had a couple of these sports drinks. Some weren't open, some were partially consumed, but labeling everything clearly will prevent any accidents, he thought as he poured herbicide into an empty bottle, but in the shuffle, he put an herbicide label on a bottle that didn't have herbicide in it, and the liquids all looked alike. Near a barn on his land, months later, GW noticed that some of the weeds kept growing that shouldn't have been there. He had sprayed here before, but seems like he needed to spray again. He got his backpack sprayer. It still had some herbicide left in it from before, and he started spraying. He thought to bring some extra chemical with him just in case he needed to refill the sprayer, and he brought some sports drink too, just in case he needed a break in the sun. After hours in the field, GW sat down to catch his breath. He was so thirsty he had been sweating for so long because it was so hot and humid outside. He unscrewed the cap without looking and took a big gulp. The moment it touched his tongue, he knew something was wrong, but he had already swallowed it when he didn't want to do that. Immediately, he knew that wasn't sports drink going down his throat, and he realized that he had put the wrong label on the wrong bottle. GW starts to panic. Whatever he swallowed needs to get out of his body as he runs towards his house. In the bathroom now, GW tried the best he could to empty his stomach, but the more he tried, the more panicked he got. A burning sensation lined his esophagus, and he could feel heat in his abdomen. A clear liquid came up. Unsure if he had gotten any of it out, and knowing that the closest hospital was at least 40 minutes away, he got into his car and started driving. On the way there, he felt like an animal was chewing a hole through his guts. He wasn't sure if this was the herbicide or just his anxiety as he arrives to the emergency room where we are now. At examination, GW's heart rate and blood pressure were sky high. He told the admitting nurse what had happened, that he thought he was going to have a sports drink, but instead drank herbicide. The moment this was told, the medical team immediately grabbed GW a tube of activated charcoal to swallow. The charcoal particle surface allows for adhesion of toxic molecules. Technically, this should inactivate the herbicide and physically, it should prevent it from absorbing into his body and prevent it from flooding into his organs. But two hours had passed now since GW accidentally swallowed the drink. The charcoal in his stomach can inactivate the herbicide that's already in his blood. When they ask him what herbicide he drank, he said he didn't know. He had thrown the bottle away months ago. But having some idea, the medical team get a sample of GW's urine. They immediately put it into a chemical test from a kit prepared for this exact situation. In the test tube, when solution is added to his urine, a dark green color appears. This tells them exactly which herbicide GW drank. It tells them that it is now absorbed into his body. It's circulating around and it has reached his kidneys. And it tells them exactly what's going to happen to him over the next few hours. GW was using Diquat Dibromite, something that's available off the shelf in most home improvement stores in the United States. As an herbicide, it's extremely effective due to its properties derived from its chemical structure. Plants use sunlight to conduct photosynthesis to produce energy necessary for their survival. This process takes water and light to transport an electron through a chain with the end result of energy and oxygen produced. Electrons are subatomic particles that are associated with energy, and you may know it best as the basis of electricity. But when diquat is sprayed onto the plant, the chemical takes away that electron used for photosynthesis and incorporates it into itself. This chemical reaction is known as reduction because electrons are negatively charged, and gaining an electron reduces that charge by the number of one. Then, oxygen that's normally inside the plant comes in contact with this reduced diquat. They react. Oxygen pulls that electron off, reducing itself before it goes on to cause problems. Diquat is then available to steal electrons again, and it doesn't stop. 
Photosynthesis no longer happens because the herbicide has disrupted normal electronic flow. The reduced oxygen, desperate to make itself normal again, reacts with several structures in the plant, not only disturbing other normal functions, but also destroying key structures necessary for survival. As the diquat endlessly cycles through electrons, the plant has no mechanism of eliminating it. Photosynthesis is shut down, starving the plant, while permanent damage is done to the cells inside the plant, completing the herbicidal action. Plants and humans are completely different beings, but inside our bodies, the same mechanism of diquat cycling electrons causing permanent damage plays out the same way. 30 minutes after arriving to the emergency room, GW was told of his impending multi-organ failure, that an insult is going to happen in the next few minutes. And even if they sedate him to put a tube down his throat so that a machine can breathe for him, and the medical team can try and support every necessary for life function in his body as best they can, there's a chance that it's too late. He might not wake up after this. As he gives the medical team advanced directives for what is about to happen, they notice that his heart rate and his blood pressure are now half of what they were when he arrived to the emergency room. He's starting to become lethargic and blue in the face. GW says what could be goodbye to his family as he's transported upstairs the hospital. In the intensive care unit, doctors find that GW has oliguria. Oligo meaning little or small, and urea referring to urine. His urine output is low, and knowing that he drank diquat, he was placed on dialysis. His blood is diverted to a machine that cleans his blood and sends it back to his body, a function that's supposed to be performed by the kidneys, but can't be now because toxic diquat is circulating around his body. But this wasn't his only problem. A camera was sent down his esophagus, and the images showed irritation and ulceration, all indicating damage along the inner lining of his stomach where the herbicide was in contact. This brings us back to the chemical structure. Diquat is a bipuridyl herbicide. Bi meaning two, and puridyl referring to pyridine, a molecule that has a high affinity for electrons. Do you remember that oxygen in plants that reacts with reduced diquat? Well, nature tends towards stability. Put it another way, nature wants things to have less energy. The opposite case of that is something has too much energy, and because the tendency is to have less energy, a high energy body will give that extra energy to surrounding structures. In this case, it will do that by reacting with what's around it. This not only disturbs normal function, but it'll also break off and destroy existing structures causing permanent damage. In humans, diquat takes electrons from normal functioning processes, just like it does in plants, and it mindlessly does that nonstop. Our oxygen isn't different from the one in plants, so inside our cells, it also pulls electrons from reduced diquat, creating superoxide. Normally, living beings have protective systems in place to handle superoxide to prevent them from doing damage. Usually, superoxide is converted to hydrogen peroxide, which is then neutralized into water. But diquat was never eliminated. It doesn't get removed from cells. It endlessly cycles back and forth, creating more and more superoxide, overwhelming and depleting all protective mechanisms. A final pathway opens up, but it isn't protective. A hydroxyl radical is created, something that rips apart cells, destroying them. Diquat doesn't change, it doesn't stop, and the body can't do anything about it as it floats around causing damage in every single organ. As the hours pass, the medical team notes that GW is starting to go into shock. His blood pressure keeps dropping. The heart has four chambers. Blood from the veins drain into the right atrium, where it's held until accepted by the right ventricle, which pumps blood into the lungs so that carbon dioxide can be exchanged out for oxygen. From the lungs, blood drains into the left atrium where it's held before going to the left ventricle, where that oxygenated blood is then pumped out of the heart to the rest of the body. As doctors look at GW's heart rhythm, they can see his left ventricular dysfunction from damage being done by diquat. If this part of the heart stops beating, the body will no longer receive any blood, causing a life-threatening emergency. But luckily, all of this can still be managed by medicines that the medical team administer through his IV lines, at least for now. When medicines or toxins are taken by mouth, they go from the esophagus to the stomach and into the small intestines where they absorb into the liver first. Typically, the liver will automatically metabolize or break down a large portion of the ingested dose. In metabolism, the liver is trying to make the chemical more stable so that it can't start reacting with parts of the body causing damage. But GW's problem is, 
diquat doesn't get metabolized. It goes to the liver, causes damage, flows out, causes more damage elsewhere before returning again. As expected, a blood test finds that GW's liver has started shutting down because parts of it have started to die and are now leaking enzymes into his blood. The only way of eliminating diquat from the body is in the urine through the kidneys, but GW's have completely shut down. The diquat has damaged GW's esophagus and his stomach from the ulceration and the swelling. It's damaged his heart, judged by the left ventricular dysfunction. His kidneys shut down just a few hours after he presented to the emergency room because he had stopped making urine. Parts of his liver have sloughed off and are now floating around in his blood, the same blood that has also shut down and is no longer able to hold onto oxygen because electrons have been taken from the iron in the hemoglobin due to the fact that GW's body is now under massive amounts amounts of oxidative stress. Almost every single organ in his body has been affected so far, except for his lungs and his brain. Nine days after GW presented to the emergency room, the medical team sends him in for a scan of his head. Because he was intubated shortly after he arrived to the hospital, he was sedated so that a machine could breathe for him, but he was also paralyzed using medicines so that full control of his body could be taken to try to manage his impending multi-organ failure. As a result, the medical team can't talk to him. They can't ask him questions to see his level of consciousness. He can't move, so they can't tell if those parts of his brain responsible for motor function are operational. But what they did notice was that GW's pupils were dilated when they weren't dilated before, and those pupils wouldn't react to light. Typically, when light is shined into the eyes, the pupils will constrict so as to limit the amount of light going in. This is a natural reflex that happens in normal function of the brain. When they don't react, it means something is wrong. And in GW, something was wrong. The scan shows that abnormalities have appeared in his brainstem that weren't there before. Scans, as the days pass, show a progressive worsening of GW's midbrain. At first, it appeared swollen with fluid, but as more time passes, the brainstem starts to look like it's starving of oxygen, something called an infarction. And while the medical team knows that this is happening, there isn't anything that they can actively do at the moment to stop or reverse this effect because Diquat has no known antidote. We know that outside of living beings, this chemical immediately deactivates and is no longer toxic the moment it touches soil. Before activated charcoal was used, patients were sometimes given bentonite clay and fuller's earth in the hopes that the herbicide would bind and become inactivated in the stomach. We understand why Diquat did the damage that it did to GW's kidneys, to his heart, and to his liver in the days after he initially drank what he thought was a sports drink. But why did damage not appear in his brain until several days after he presented to the emergency room? This brings us back to Diquat's electron cycling. In plants, all available mechanisms to protect against superoxide get exhausted. The resulting hydrogen peroxide then takes an electron from an iron-containing compound in photosystem 1 called ferredoxin, shutting down photosynthesis. In humans, this hydrogen peroxide also takes an electron from iron, but for us, instead of photosystems, we have iron in the hemoglobin of our blood cells. Stealing electrons there makes it so that our blood can no longer carry oxygen, which is something that was happening to GW, explaining why he started to become blue in the face just after he arrived to the emergency room. But in his brain, the location where all the damage was happening is the area where the red nuclei are. These are somewhat responsible for helping us control and coordinate movement, but they're red due to the presence of iron, and in diquat poisoning cases where brainstem infarcts are documented, most of them occurred around this area, possibly because of the role of iron assisting the non-stop diquat redox cycling. But the reality is, we're still not entirely sure exactly why it happens this way to the brainstem. We just know that it can happen if the patient survives the ingestion long enough. Bipuridal herbicide ingestions can be survivable. If they're treated very early and the patient didn't drink more than a couple of drops, the initial organ failure may not be so severe, but there's still a percentage of people who will go on to get a brainstem injury days later. It's documented that patients may look okay for days in the hospital, but then quickly become unresponsive, ending with permanent brain damage. Often, we hear much about herbicides, pesticides, lawn and landscaping, and farming chemicals that can be dangerous. Commonly, at home improvement stores, you'll find glyphosate-based herbicides, which is not a bipuridal compound. And it appears that these consumer products are in lower concentrations than what you would find with commercial agricultural use. 
at least in the acute toxicity setting, the effects are not the same level of impending doom for a single gulp ingested. A newly documented mechanism of cell death involving iron and lipid peroxidation from reactive oxygen species is called ferroptosis. Understanding this mechanism, if it's even taking place in the setting of diquat poisoning, might be able to help understand what other therapies could be used because bipyridyl herbicides don't currently have a known antidote. And diquat isn't the only herbicide in this class. Much more common than diquat is the chemical paraquat, which in the United States is categorized for restricted use in agriculture and cannot be purchased at home improvement stores. GW's lungs never completely shut down, and the medical team didn't have to worry about permanent damage there, because diquat can't absorb into the lungs the same way that paraquat can, which causes irreversible permanent lung damage because of a special quality involving the space between nitrogens, in this case part of the puridal moieties. Paraquat can also be absorbed through certain parts of the skin in massive quantities, all of this described in this video that you can watch and is launching first on Nebula, a streaming service that was created by creators. Nebula has a huge catalog of Nebula originals from all sorts of creators like Real Engineering, Real Life Lore, Wendover Productions, and almost 200 others. They've made shows, documentaries, films, plays, and Nebula is able to offer this thanks to funding that comes from subscribers who, in addition to getting all of these, also get early access to creators' regular videos ad-free. This Paraquat video, I can speak a little bit more directly on Nebula about what exactly happened because you can see the title. This is a different route of administration, and the toxicity plays out a little bit differently because of that, but also due to a small change in the chemical structure. I happen to subscribe to Nebula myself, paid for with my own money, and it's awesome to see stuff like their travel game show, Jetlag the Game. It's cool for me because I know a lot of these creators, I had met them in person for the first time many years ago, and now I have the opportunity to be part of Nebula with them. So if you sign up at nebula.tv slash chubby emu, or you click the link in the description below, you'll receive a big 40% off yearly subscription, which comes down to $2.50 a month. And you'll get access to the whole platform, so you'll see this video, and in here you'll see that I can describe a medical case in a way that I wouldn't otherwise be able to. That's that patient. But for GW, it's too late. 17 days after presenting to the emergency room, an erratic heart rhythm appeared. It developed into a situation where the left ventricle started shaking in place, not actually coming to a full contraction to move blood throughout the body. Several minutes passed as the medical team tried to do CPR to resuscitate him and to get his heart rhythm somewhat normal again. But the medical team was not able to resuscitate him. Following the advanced directives given by GW before he was intubated, he was returned back to his family. This was an accident that unfortunately isn't that uncommon. Chemicals like this should never be put into food containers or food packaging. It's why the label specifically mentions this scenario. Always separate and always put very far away in distance from one another to try to make it as unlikely as possible for anyone to ever get these chemicals inside their body. Thanks so much for watching. Take care of yourself and be well.